morning. My name is David. This is week 14 of 52 churches in 52 weeks. Hit the like button and subscribe if you like to stay up to date with this intentional church hopping. If you like to read about the first 52 churches in 52 weeks, I'll leave one of those fancy graphics up here in the corner uh, if you like to take a look at that. Today is a dark and gloomy day in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Um, the last couple weeks I've been having some strange um, coincidences happening in my life surrounding symbolism from my past. And um, for this week, especially with the summer, I was hoping to go further out and try different states, different type of churches, niche churches, all kinds of different things. But my plans have kind of fallen apart a little bit just due to a prior illness. And then also my, my vehicle's acting wonky. So I gotta get, I gotta bring it into the shop sometime this week. Um, I want to get away from the symbolism that's been happening the last couple of weeks. So this morning I just randomly picked uh, a church and today I'm going to be doing St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, this is an Episcopalian church. From the first 52 and 52 book, uh, I had a, a certain fondness for the Episcopalian uh, two churches that I visited. It was actually two, one hometown, another one that was more touristy. And the liturgy I found just really beautiful. Um, and also when it came to this kind of merging, when it came to the more traditional kind of Catholic faith, and then you, your more evangelical Protestant faith, and then you kind of merged that together and you got the Episcopalian faith. I was just so curious about it. And as I've traveled and looked around, and it, it's strange. The two churches I visited that were Episcopalian before, they didn't have red doors. But at any time I'm driving by an Episcopalian church, it seems, every single church I find, it's this bright red door. It's like it's never faded. And I don't know why, but it's it just speaks to me. It just catches your eye and you just, I've always wanted to just go right in. So I'm gonna check out this Episcopalian church today. I'm running a little late, so I need to get in there before service starts. So I'll show you a couple sights and sounds inside and have some closing thoughts in a little bit. So first things first, um, biggest takeaway from this visit is churches like this are really becoming a lost art. Uh, you know, when it comes to more modern churches, it's going much more towards um, topical preaching, uh, you know, more modern type of worship music kind of at the forefront. That's what's bringing in the kids. That's what's bringing in so many different people. And you see some of these more traditional, old school, Protestant type of churches, attendance is really declining. And after visiting this church, man, there is so many hidden treasures, so much um, expressions in stone in terms of how a building that may have been built 125 years ago may be considered ancient in today's day and age. And 
to really kind of see just what we're really missing out on uh, when it comes to cathedrals like this particular one with St. Paul's Cathedral. The red door is, again, one of the things that just was so eye-popping to me when it comes to this particular denomination. And I want to understand why all the red doors. My theory was maybe it's it harkens back to Exodus when uh, the angel of death was appearing and the Jews were told to uh, you know, mark their doors with blood, make it a red door, essentially. Um, my, my answer I got back was, no, it was just like in the late 1970s, 1980s, just to mark this was a place of sanctuary, uh, a place of peace, I guess a place of protection, too. So that kind of goes back to the Exodus story. Online, there's other answers, one of which is the mortgage was paid off. That doesn't seem like a very theological uh, answer, so I, I don't believe that one. The, when you walk in and you, you have two ushers, they give you your bulletin. And the very first thing that you notice is a baptismal font made of marble right on the right side. Absolutely gorgeous. And as you step further into the nave, the first thing that you notice then is you have all these five foot statues of all 12 apostles. And one of the interesting things I learned was the second bishop of this church, like he paid, he had spent so much money putting in um, resources into the church to make it as beautiful as possible to glorify God. He paid $96 for each of these statues back then, 125 years ago, and it had every single apostle. Then above the apostles, you'd have all these um, kind of like gargoyle style angels above them. And then you had murals and the murals were um, essentially key moments within Jesus's ministry. So as I learned, the building was designed to walk you through Christ's ministry. So it starts at the baptismal font. That's when Christ started his ministry when he was baptized. You go through, he, he gets his 12 disciples. He has all these key moments in his ministry in just three short years. And then as you get further up into the altar area, then you, ha you have your first step. You have to step up. And both sides of the altar area, one side has the angel of life. The other side is the angel of death. And uh, above that is Jesus Christ being crucified as four onlookers look on. And the, the four statues, from my understand, it was Mary Magdalene, um, Mother Mary, John, and, a, and then third Mary, who was married to someone else. It seems like everyone's name was Mary back then if you were female. I don't understand why, but... So you have the crucifixion, so that's a huge sim symbolism when it comes to what you do during your life and what happens after death. Everything is centered on the cross, and as you go further up into the chancel area, they have a, a beautiful bedazzled type of cross, and it's almost like the cross has been redefined. Whereas before, with the crucifixion, the cross was a symbol of death and destruction and torment and agony. But now with this new bedazzled cross, it's, uh, re it's transfigured. It's made new. And as I learned later from a, a gentleman who, you know, helped out with a lot of uh, the history on this church, the stained glass windows behind that then depict imagery from the resurrection and the ascension. So you just don't see that in modern type of churches anymore. And when it comes to a Protestant church like this Episcopalian church, having attended it, it's, it's beautiful. The liturgy is great. But at the same time, like attendance is just not there. So when it came to this service, um, the first time I went to Episcopalian church, I'd say there were about 26 people is from my count in the book. And when they would do prayers, 13 people, I remember the first time, and I counted this, 
13 people got down on the kneelers to pray Catholic style and 13 would pray standing up Protestant style. This church, 24, 25 people from what I counted, the majority would, when we would pray, typically the majority would do the, the kneelers. But again, I'm not, I'm not exactly a spring chicken myself, but I was the second youngest in attendance. And it's, it, it, it bothers me just to see a church like this with so many hidden treasures, with so much imagery, with so much just expressions in stone and artwork and how people over a hundred years ago use their talents, their sculpting abilities, their woodworking, their painting skills to glorify God. And now to see that um, with a church like this, where it's almost like they need to rely almost on tourism to keep all the upkeep and the maintenance costs intact, um, there's something being lost. And that's what's really difficult um, after attending this particular service. When it came to the liturgy, um, it's so short. Um, you get the bulletin, and this is probably one of the most, um, so much pages <laughs> when it came to this, but the actual church service itself, it was only 35 minutes. Like it was not long at all. And the sermon from the deacon, that was only five minutes. So it's not, I understand where more people are going to go towards a modern church where you may get like a 30, 40 minutes of really top-notch type of preaching. With this, you're not really getting that. But again, it's not necessarily the preaching that you're going here for. It's the sacrament. It's the communion. It's everything around you to really make you feel Christ's presence, if that makes any sense. One thing I really liked about the Episcopalian Church the first time I visited was open communion, and especially when it comes to the action that you take. So you're invited up as long as that you are a professing Christian and that you've had baptism, from what I understand. You get out, out of your pew, you walk up, you kneel down, and then you receive the wafer, the bread, and then you also receive the chalice or a cup for wine. And something weird happened. Because when I got up there, and I was towards the end, so the rail was full of everyone. So they got their communion, and then I kneeled down, and I think another gentleman and his wife. And they both received the bread, I received the bread, and then they got up. And next thing I know, I'm the only one at the rail. And I couldn't see what the deacon was doing. So I'm like, well, maybe, maybe this is a church where there's two different parts of it. Maybe at one point you go get the bread and then the other one you get the wine. So I left, but then as I learned when I got back to my pew, that was the end of the service. So I've never gone, it's completely new to me. I've never received half of communion before. So I don't know what happened, miscommunication or something. Um, weird. Episcopal church, where did it come from? So in my real quick crash course to understand what this church denomination originated from. So they started off as the Church of England. So the Church of England, obviously a lot of people migrated over, pilgrimed over to the United States. And when the Revolutionary War broke out, it caused a problem because when the Church of England, all the clergy had sworn an oath to the King of England. And when it came to those clergy, I don't know if they were forced to, but they would pray for the King of England on a daily basis. So, and I'm not going to go into the Revolutionary War. If you need to, to do a recap of that, watch Hamilton. I don't know. But a lot of the Church of England clergy in the United States, like they remain loyalists to the crown. So when the United States, America broke off from England, like that left the Church of England in this head scratcher situation because you can't have a bunch of clergy and an entire church still devoted to England. So my understanding is then they, and my understanding is James Madison factored into it to basically do a copy and paste 
of the Church of England's hierarchy to bring it into like a Church of England, not of England type of church with the Episcopal one. And that's how I understand the Episcopal faith got started. Just strange. Tell you what, that's going to wrap up week 14. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little inside look uh, inside a, a random Episcopal church. Uh, if you'd like to stay up to date for future church visits, hit the like button and subscribe. As always, if you'd like to read about the first 52 churches in 52 weeks, that's on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description box below. Thanks for your time and hope you have a good one.